It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Valerie Stevenson, who is the Administrative Director of the Neurological Emergencies Treatment Trials Network. Um, what I am going to just let you know is, as you know, there's a small group session after this, and one of the tasks of your small group is we've come up with exercises where you are going to come up with budgets as a small group for the scenarios that are presented. And you're going to go into a, a little bit of that. And then we're going to gather back as a group. And then what we think is going to be interested is what's the range of, of budgets that is produced by all the small groups. So again, I think the, the idea here is that we want you to do a nice job as small groups and looking at this. We think this exercise will be useful in terms of you determining how to budget for both your, your current smaller phase trials and perhaps larger scale trials in the future. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Valerie. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just really happy to be here today. And as Will said, my name is Valerie Stevenson, and I work with the NET, and I work on pre- and post-award work. And um, today's presentation, I just want to go over some um, information on budgeting in a blog, because when I look at your proposals, there's so many great proposals that are very a little bit. So we don't want to get too deep into the weeds and specifics, but we'll just talk about proposals in a broad way. And then we'll share um, how we, you know, some of the things that come up, you know, commonly that may, you know, be a hindrance when you're putting your budget together. So just a few disclosures. My salary at the University of Michigan is supported by an NIH grant. Aside from the NIH grant, I have no other financial disclosures. And then the content of the presentation is developed by myself. It does not replace any, replace any NIH policy or guidance. And we have a link to policies here. So again, we just want to understand funding opportunities. We're not going to go too deep in the weeds on FOAs because again, we'll be applying for different technical awards. We'll just talk about what we're looking at when we look at funding opportunities. Um, identify budget considerations, and again, kind of in a broad sense, and we'll talk about a couple scenarios along the way that could be um, challenges when you're putting together your budget. Um, we'll talk about strategies in developing the draft budget, as well as considering sub-agreement options and their impact on your budget. We don't get too deep into sub-agreements or contracts because that is a whole different conversation on itself. We could talk for hours about those type of things. But just enough to kind of give you enough information that you it's mindful when you're putting together budgets. And again, um, identifying some financial models for proposing and administering clinical trials. Um, after we do this, again, we'll have some exercises. But I'm hoping that we can spend most of our time towards the the presentation today answering questions. So what is budgeting? Budgeting for clinical trials is just like budgeting you in your own life. You balance what you need with the amount of funds that are available. Sometimes you um, have an opportunity to gather more funds. Sometimes you have to back out what you want and what you need to do in order to make a balance with the new amount that's available. So when we look at funding opportunities, there's all kinds of different awards out there. First thing you want to understand about what you're applying for is that each one is different. And NIH awards are often you know, all different. There can be R01s, there's R25s, there's cooperative agreements. So each one of them has their own terms. So when you're thinking about a budget and what you're trying to do, you want to look for the right opportunity for you. So you have to ask yourself, within the opportunity you're looking, is there a capitated amount? For example, if it says this award will not exceed $500,000 a year, and you know that you're going to exceed that, then maybe that's not the right opportunity for you. So I would like to see if there's a capitated amount. And again, it can change by the way. What can be funded? Some um, awards will have some, you'll be reading, you'll have a colleague who just turned one in at the last cycle. And this wedding announcement will say that, you know, you can't pay an investigator more than this amount of money. It'll say that you can't include certain types of assays. You may have different restrictions on um, supplying, or providing salaries for people who are um, not born in the United States. There's all kinds of tricky little things in there that you have to make sure you read in your funding opportunities. Um, does the capitated amount include indirect costs? We'll talk about indirect costs here um, more, but um, those are those can really add up kind of quickly. They're kind of the hidden costs of doing research when you're trying to put a budget that kind of creep up on it. Um, again, are there any special terms or conditions? Sometimes you may have an award that says that you have to budget $3,000 for travel. And you'll kind of read it and you'll think, hmm, does that mean I have to budget $3,000? Or I can only budget $3,000. So when you read the terms, if you have any questions, there's always um, information to contact a grants manager. 
kind of clarify what they're asking. So if you ever see any terms in there that you're just not sure of, contact grants management, because there are some things in there that can be a little tricky. You know the deadlines for sure. Some of them are different grant cycles and they change. And I always say to start early, which is kind of fun, but for some reason we all kind of go to the last minute and turn in things, you know, and kind of push against deadlines. So I just start early, especially with budgets, because a lot of times you're working on the science, but then you find you have to like send budgets to different institutions and there may be things you don't know. So when it comes to budgeting, start having conversations early. <coughs> So when we talk about budgeting and budget considerations, probably the number one thing that we all need to consider is personnel. So we have all types of different personnel. We have, we have people that we consider co-investigators, which may be people that work to pull the concept together with us. We have study team members. They could be, again, other investigators in your institution that may not be contributing as much to the science. Coordinators, research assistants. Um, I put consultants in this group. Many times when you're putting budgets together, they appear in a different place in the budget. But still, the people that you need to consider when you're putting together budgets and considering personnel. Some of the items I have here that say have a little caution mark, and through the presentation, these are um, items that sometimes can be a little tricky if you don't answer the right questions. So administrative staff and a grant may or may not be allowed. So if you have a secretary or someone in your administrative staff, that's going to be spending a lot of time, you know, putting together letters or developing, you know, setting up surveys. That salary may not be allowed in a federal grant, but then again, if you're doing a foundations grant, that salary may be allowed. But generally, when you consider administrative staff, usually you can't consider their salaries. That's not a center grant or a project grant, but some things you need to kind of think about when you're thinking about how the work is being assigned. Um, one thing that gets people, you know, kind of tricks them is being conservative when you think about multitasking staff. So if you're working on an ancillary study to an ongoing study, and you're like, oh gosh, coordinator for that study can just grab that tube of blood while they're there, I and mean, they're down there enrolling the patient, doesn't always work. Because <laughs> that person is busy enrolling for another study. So sometimes we kind of think that that might work, but you really got to consider the multitasking of it, because it may seem like maybe they're, they got good geography, but they just don't have the time. The other thing that can sneak up on you when you're thinking about multitasking staff is within your own departments. Some of us are very fortunate. We have nice research um, machines within our department. And you know, they have coordinators and your chair or a fellow investigator may say, you know, we got this cover, you don't need to budget this, our coordinators are roaming 24 hours a day. So you're like, okay, great, I have a coordinator for free. Then the chair moves to someplace, you know, west and warmer here, and all of a sudden you don't have a coordinator. So be really sensitive when you um, think about um, kind of sharing work or multitasking personnel. And then um, don't forget about fringe benefits. It's kind of, if you talk to somebody and you ask a colleague or a coordinator, hey, what's your salary? <laughs> they might tell you $40,000, but they're not building in there as the fringe benefit rate for them. So I just give me consider uh, fringe benefit rates. And then if you're collaborating with someone, look for a role to the patient. And this can happen a lot. You don't think it can happen, but if you're collaborating with somebody, and all of a sudden they'll give you a list of persons, and they have a project manager and a coordinator, and you have a project manager and a coordinator, and all of a sudden you have a couple coordinators. So you just want to look for duplication of that. So there can be duplication of roles. It's kind of an you know, intellectual snowball effect. Supplies. Supplies are an interesting category because you know, we get these binders. A lot of people don't use binders anymore. It could be glassware, specimen collections. I put computers there, but now supplies are coming into probes, catheters, um, some investigational product. If you you know, you have to, if you're doing a study with an approved medication, and you have to actually buy the medication, that turns into a supply if it's not donated. So in your supply budget, you need to be considerate of what you're um, actually buying as a supply. Office supplies, though, things that you generally think is an office supply, like, how many need paper and pencils and pens, those type of um, items are usually not allowed on a grant. They're part of the indirect cost. Um, unless you're doing something like survey research where you're sending out thousands of surveys or your activity is really heavily survey-based, then things like stamps and letters and mailing and things can't be um, charged with grant. Another thing where sometimes people um, 
kind of think the vegan budget is kind of an awkward thing is, well, we're going to hang out for all of um, the study team members when they enroll somebody, we're going to give them a mug. We're going to budget for this mug. So if you're buying, you can do that, but you may not be able to budget it into a grant. So we call gifts and swag a lot of times. Um, they're okay to give, depending on, um, you know, because then you got to watch out about gifting. But sometimes those things come up and you need to pay for them in a different way, you know, right into a grant. Equipment, equipment's different than a supply. Usually equipment is something big you buy, a freezer, an atom smasher, uh, <laughs> something really big. Uh, and it could be a monitoring um, unit. So if you're going to like, um, you're doing a study that requires some kind of invasive monitoring, the actual probe or um, device that you're using to measure may be a supply. But the unit that you have to purchase in order to capture the data could be equipment. So sometimes they're part of the same unit and you have to break those out. But if, and um, not to get too deep into the weeds with equipment, but with the uniform guidance now, the NIH is interested in equipment you buy to see if it can be used by other investigators. So sometimes, um, you know, because they don't want everybody buying a freezer if there's a lot of freezers out there. So sometimes you just need to um, consider your equipment if you really need to purchase it or using it or um, paying for storage space is a better option for you. Alterations and renovations, that's like a construction grant. I've never seen anybody get um, money to alter or renovate. Um, you know, that's for like, you know, knocking down walls, that's a good activity. Usually people don't need it if you, you know, that's not the kind of research that she's involved in clinical research. There's a place for it. One time we had someone ask, well, if we have to add office space, can we get that paid for? The answer usually is no. But you'll see that on grants. Especially um, NIH grants, but again, I've never seen one fund that has renovation funds. Travel. So travel um, is an interesting category. Travel includes all types of things, um, you know, kind of starting from the bottom. Parking for meetings, mileage to, the, um, to go to the airport, meals when you park, when you travel. When someone's on the road, those kind of things you have to think about. Because you may pay for what um, cover the cost for someone to come to your investigator meeting, but chances are you don't want them to incur the expense of airport parking or meals and those type of things. And those are small costs that can kind of get away, um, tolls, that type of stuff. So you're just going to consider some of the incidentals for that. Um, site training and initiation and evaluation, that type of travel is allowed. Um, Benchmarking travel for study team members, that's a good, a good way to figure out how much um, travel is. But um, again, travel, um, travel budgets, depending on what you're doing, can be pretty sizable. You always want to budget a little bit of travel, unless you have something in there in case you have to have a meeting, like with the sponsor. Um, so travel is always something that usually appears in the budget. Whether or not you have a huge meeting every year, um, they may not be something you need, but you want to be able to um, at least have money, money to budget to meet with collaborators. Others, um, that's a kind of a category that collects a lot of activity. Um, other could be services you're contracting. Uh, for example, if you need a central lab or you need UPS to ship samples, that's considered um, other activity. Um, I'm starting to see a lot of proposals come through with IT charges. And IT charges can sneak up on you pretty quick. For example, if you're working with an institution and you have six investigators there and there's a $200 computer charge um, each year, then you're like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> as much as you have a capitated budget. So you always want to find out about some of those smaller charges that fit into other. They may not be charges that you're thinking of, but they may be charges that other institutions are going to be charging you. And that's a good reason to start early to find out what some of these smaller costs are. Because they're starting to creep into one more time. Um, toll calls. Um, now that we're all kind of in the electronic age, we have Skype and a couple other um, modalities like blue jeans that people may not have to pay as much for. But if you have a lot of long distance calls or you're paying, you're paying a lot of telemeetings, you can budget for long distance calls um, and toll calls as part of your grant. What you can't do is you can't um, budget, and that's again a little caution sign. You can't budget for your long distance call. So if you're going to call me in Michigan and you live in San Francisco, you can't budget to cover that call. But if you're having a call with a large group of people, like coordinators and investigators, that's an allowable charge. So you just kind of want to think about that. You know, if you are capitated and you want to have all these in-person meetings, then maybe you should be thinking about having toll calls and saving a little bit of money in travel. 
Um, meeting expenses, that comes in there a lot. Um, meeting expenses you can have for room rentals. If we're here today, this would be an appropriate expense. Um, what you can't have is like a room that you're running to use as an office. That may not come as an appropriate room rental. Um, Audio-visual equipment, that is a, that's something you should be budgeting for if you plan on having meetings that sometimes you forget about, but can be very, very expensive. And um, what I tell sub students during a meeting, food. Food is a real slippery slope. Um, so, for example, if you traveled from afar and you stop at a McDonald's at the airport, that might be appropriate to be covered. If you decide to buy bagels for your lab meeting because you get better attendance when you buy bagels, that's not covered. <laughs> so, food is a really slippery slope when it comes to sustenance. So, you always kind of got to look at what you're spending for and in your budget justification, share while you're buying food. It's just a really sensitive area. And of course, with federal grants, just add no alcohol, no wine. Stay away from it. You can't pay for a bartender. Like if you think, oh, we're going to have this activity and we're going to have an open bar, but people can pay for themselves. You can't even cover the cost of a bartender. So that's something that um, someone that was working with another grant um, had shared with me that they kind of got stuck with a big charge for bartenders. Um, for subject budgets. These are kind of general things because again, when I looked at a lot of your proposals, they're a little bit different. But when we think about per subject budget, a good thing to do is just to kind of walk yourself through the minute that someone has an interaction with a patient or prepares to have an interaction with a patient. So someone's going to have to screen for the patient. There's some personal thoughts. Someone has to talk to the patient. Well, well they chose not to participate, but you still have costs. So you're kind of thinking, okay, is there an intervention? Um, do they need a special test? Do they need um, time? For example, one of our sites found out that medication was um, not charged, but there was like some a research medication charge fee for just running an IV pump for an hour. So there's all kinds of charges that kind of come in there. So patient care costs, you gotta really be um, careful because some things just kind of sneak up on you. Again, um, some of them, when we talk about um, facilities and administrative cost recovery, they're exempt from it. But some things you can't assume, again, that are going to be just standard of care. For example, well, it's a, you know, any medical center, they're going to do a CT you know, 48 hours. I mean, everybody does it. They may not do it. <laughs> so when you think about um, the interventions, kind of map them out and just touch base with the institutions you're working with to see if they're actually things that are covered. Um, when you're working with patient care budgets, again, you know, we, you know, each study is a little bit different, but it's a good thing to ask other investigators who've done this type of work, and then bring in a coordinator. Um, even if, you know, maybe in your department, maybe somebody you know, just kind of have them talk to you and ask you, you know, for example, how do you think this would go? Um, we were working with a blood study, and we asked the coordinator, and she's like, you want me to do what? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna be busy enrolling this patient for this study, I can't go and spin something that takes 30 seconds and run it up to a lab. You know, but the person who was thinking that maybe they could do that, their centrifuge was right there in the emergency department. This person, when you talk to them, their centrifuge was in another part of the hospital, and then their freezer was over in another building. So sometimes those things don't work out. So you always want to make sure that you get um, input from people who are doing the work. Um, institutional expertise, usually you have somebody from a lab or someone that's going to kind of help you. You know, you know, depending on where you're from, it's probably not the first research study that's been done in an institution. So institutional expertise. There's probably a finance and grant person in your department. I can share from my experience and from my colleagues that work at the university. Talk to us early, because there's nothing like getting a proposal and someone's got a great idea like, well, we can't afford that, so we're not going to do that. It's like, you got to cover that. You, you know, there's certain things you have to cover. So asking somebody from your grant finance team, they're usually happy to help. Um, again, benchmark other institutions, historical data from other trials that have done the work, just ask them if they've had anything that's come up. And then one thing um, when we're talking about per subject payments, if you're a single site and you're doing um, enrolling subjects, you would probably pay for the subject enrollments through paying for effort for your coordinator, paying for your own effort. But if you're doing a multi-center trial, you need to think about per-subject payments that you need to send to other institutions. 
So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But it, um, usually you can't give yourself a per subject payment. You can't budget for your um, investigator effort, coordinator effort, and then go, okay, yeah, we know the subject, no money. Usually that's not. So it is something you need to be careful about when you're thinking of your own site budget. The part of budgets that everybody loves, and when you're new to doing budgets, it's um, totally confusing. Facilities and administrative costs, also known as FNA, aka indirect costs. So why do we have indirect costs? There's really a good reason. Some people think, oh gosh, the university, they're already making so much money. Why aren't they charging my, my study? Well, there's a reason. Um, it's a real cost of the university's operations, for example, heat, electricity, lab space, security, housekeeping, all of those things that happen in your offices and your labs are covered through indirect costs. Um, grants people, um, contracts people, all those people, they're usually covered for your costs. Um, so, and there's things that you can assign to a project. So getting back to your administrative person, you may have somebody in your um, a secretary or someone who's working administratively for you. Their salaries would be covered through the FNA recovery that your institution has versus what you would budget for them in the grant. So there's a real reason why we have um, facilities and administrative costs. The one thing about facilities and administrative costs is that they vary depending on the awards and institutions. So the information, for example, that's publicly available at the university, our facilities and administrative costs is 55%. If you were at Mass General, last time I knew it was 74%. So you really need to, again, touch base with collaborators to find out what their rates are. Another thing that you'll find out is different awards will say what the FNA rate is. Some of them will say you can only collect 8%. So if your institution is willing to take 8%, we'll sign off and you get 8% facilities and administrative costs. If you're working with a foundation, foundation say, you know what, we don't pay facilities and administrative costs, but we will allow you to budget for a summer too. So again, they vary. They have off-campus rates. They have on-campus research rates. This is where you want to contact your medical school or your grants processing group to understand what the rate is for your proposal. Again, a lot of times it will say in your um, FOA or your um, RFA what the research, the, if there's a capitation. But again, you want to communicate with your institution to find out what that rate is. So, um, when we think about F and A rates, they kind of tee into the type of agreement you use. And that's really important in your budgeting because different types of agreements that you have have different F and A recovery schemes. So they can really increase the amount of your budget. So for example, if you have a study that says your direct costs, including your facilities and administrative crafts, can't go over five hundred thousand dollars, and you want to do your research, then you want to do the smartest things you can to you know, make sure your facilities and administrative costs aren't excessive, so you can put that money into the research. So that's where it gets a balancing act. Um, and that's why I wanted to talk about it here, because facilities and administrative costs are the costs that tend to sneak up on most people. Um, so there's four types of agreements. There's different types of subtleties in them. But the four main are uh, cost reimbursable agreement. And that would be like, I'm the investigator, you're my co-investigator, we send a contract to your institution, I'm going to cover 10% of your effort and your fringe, and I'm going to pay your institution their F&A rate, and that's the type of agreement. That is a cost reimbursable. And then your institution signs and you certify your efforts, that indeed you spent 10% of your time on my project. A vendor agreement's a little different. That's where you hire someone to process your laboratory results. So um, vendors can be, they can be companies that process your blood, Vendors can also be brilliant endocrinologists or very various other smart people that have vendor agreements that aren't a company that have a vendor agreement. And there's some subtleties between classifying them as vendors and consultants. But um, again, your institutional health work you through those things. Um, and then there's hybrids. And we'll talk about those a little bit more when we're talking about facility payments. So I'm going to get two um, readings to you because no one likes to be read to you. But when we talk about truce of contracts, whereas you're my collaborator, you need to be 10% and cover 10% of your time, when we do that, um, they have to be five criteria. And these five criteria are in the, the federal circular about what you need to have to consider something a subcontract. And the reason why that's important is 
And when you're looking at um, your budget, you can't, it's, you can't just bump, you know what, I'm really going to treat them as this because that saves me money. They have to meet certain criteria in order to fit into these certain categories. So um, we have them here on the board, but usually it's somebody who's contributing in a way that's extremely unique. So if your brilliant endocrinologist is coming up and helping you develop assays, worked with you on the protocol, um, has done a lot of work for you, and is very unique in, when he's in his work, then he may be a cost reimbursable project. If it's someone that's just consulting on your projects, make this your protocol, yeah, we'd be happy to help, my lab can do this, then they may be a consultant. So people who are meeting the five criteria for subcontracts have to meet all five criteria, not just four, not just two, they have to meet all five. And usually your institution, when they're looking at things that you're passing through to get signed off, because your institution is the, um, puts their stamp on it that says, yes, they agree to the terms that you're offering to do, they'll usually come and say, this really isn't a subcontract, this is more of a vendor agreement, or this is more of a consulting agreement. And again, sometimes, we think of subcontracts because when we talk about F and A recovery, um, subcontracts usually have less recovery. So when if we're covering ten percent of your effort for a five-year grant, after a year and a half, we may not take facilities administrative costs anymore because we've reached a threshold. So for cost reimbursable agreements, once I've sent your institution twenty-five thousand dollars, my institution sent you the grant, no longer takes up an A recovery, so that saves my total money, so I can put that into samples or screening or something else. If I have a consulting agreement, and I want to give a consultant $10,000, every time I give that consultant $10,000, even after $25,000, my institution assesses our F and A grant. So, for example, if it's 55, 55%, for every dollar I pay a consultant, over the course of the study, my institution takes 55 cents. So if I'm working with a study that's half of the total, I'm like, oh gosh, I don't want to pay that. <laughs> I want to try some other agreement, but it may not fit. So when we're looking at agreements, um, just real quickly, they're kind of the triaging of them. If they meet all five criteria, then indeed they're a true subcontract. If they don't, and they um, fall into other categories, they may be a vendor or consultant. The difference is, and this is, comes up for a lot of multi-center studies, so if you're developing one or you're on the other end of it, is are they um, product, you know, following a protocol that um, could be done at any other institution by an equally brilliant investigator? So if you're enrolling subjects based on the protocol and they're doing the same amount of work at, let's say, the University of Alabama, as they would do at the University of Michigan, then they may qualify for what they call a hybrid agreement or a hybrid subcontract. And these are becoming more and more popular over the last 10 years or so. So, um, you know, we follow that. And again, if, if it doesn't fit in any of these categories, then something went wrong. <laughs> Where you're at, the questions weren't answered correctly or something, because most of your agreements will fit into the category that we should. So, why, um, when we talk about per subject payments, I have no. Um, Marriage to the hybrid, but just to share for hybrid agreements. Why would you have a lot of per subject payments and then you get patients that are outside your institution? Because right now you may be working on a proposal, but your next proposal may involve three or four sites. Um, I always like to show this graph because right here, this is an older um, chart for enrollment. But when we ask an institution, or when we talk about budgets, we think I have five institutions, I have to enroll 500 stuff. Each institution will roll 100 subjects. They say they can get them. These patients are falling out of the sky. They're, here they are, here comes one now. Right, and that's what we guys hear. Everybody's gonna enroll. Yeah, I'm gonna get 10 more. Chances are they don't. <laughs> so what we find is that um, great institutions, strong institutions, but we always find this kind of pattern of enrollment. When one institution is kind of, one institution's kind of cranky, the rest of the institutions are kind of follow behind, but one's kind of has the shape. So if you're thinking about trying to budget that in different F and A rates, in different costs for coordinators and stuff, you're chasing your tail. You end up losing your mind. The other part is, did I say it in a fun way? But um, the other part is too is that you'll have a study that is a site that is really strong. Let's say you're doing stroke studies. This site has shown that they're extremely strong at stroke studies. So you say, hey, well, 
for the last minute, they got 10% of the patients, so I'm thinking they're gonna get at least 10% of the patients this time. All of a sudden, the investigator again was somewhere hot and warm and west of here, and then all of a sudden their enrollment changes. Or something you wouldn't even think about as a coordinator. I think sometimes you have a coordinator change in the institution, and you can just see enrollment drop, and you're like, gosh, what happened? Did they close the doors? Did they lock the shop? Like, no, they got a new coordinator, or they lost a coordinator. So this is why we like to use hybrid agreements, because it's a set rate for a set fee, and we can kind of, um, again, the paperwork's smaller, because we're not routing with just the contracts. We put them in the budget as a single line, so we're going to pay each site $10,000 for 500 subjects. I know what my costs are. Um, I don't have to juggle a bunch of different rates. You can use competitive enrollments. And there's a little flexibility if you have to add a site or drop a site. Usually there's not too much cost. So I shared that more, I focus on hybrids there just because they're a little bit different. But if you're doing multi-center clinical trials, they're starting to come up more and more. Stroke net, this is how they work budgets. Um, with different um, groups, they pay for subject. So um, I just want to show something a little bit. One thing I wanted to um, kind of retouch on is that in this when we talk about how FNA is assessed, I put a caution with hybrid agreements. So hybrid agreements, before you start, you know, when you start thinking about how you're going to implement these, FNA recovery for hybrid agreements, it could be that your institution looks at them as fee for service payments and they want to assess FNA recovery in every single payment. So if you're going to have those, if you're desperately thinking about doing, have that discussion ahead of time. Like, Talk with your medical school or your dean or your department and say, you know, we like to use a hybrid approach where we treat these like a subcontract, so we only take the first um, F&A on the first 25000 but then we want to, you know, actually work this as a vendor agreement, and that's what we call the hybrid. So I put a caution in there and I put the pens, and I stole that word from our director of our medical school grants office because she always says, well, it depends. <laughs> So it's a conversation you want to have. You don't want to go in there and be like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And your institution's like, great, great. Yeah, you know, we're going to have all this F&A recovery. So again, when you think about how you're going to set up your agreements, um, hybrid agreements, that approach is a really smooth approach. But you want to make sure that it doesn't impact your overall total or put you where you might be able to cap your, your proposal. So um, we consider how to package proposals when it comes to budgeting. What we want to consider is the re what reimbursement strategy works best for you and falls into the appropriate categories. What are your collaborators doing for the trial? Um, many times, especially if you're working with people, they have, again, people that they're bringing on board. And you want to make sure that they're not duplicating. And you know, again, if they're actually contributing in a um, way that can't be accomplished from another contributor, you kind of want to look and see um, you know, if that's appropriate, or maybe effort needs to be adjusted, especially when you're working with the capitated uh, announcement. Um, will your medical school or um, dean consider a different kind of F&A recovery? Yeah, at first you may be intimidated, but we asked our medical school a few years ago, so we're like, here's what, and they're like, why do you want to do this? And so we made this very cogent argument about why we want to do this. They allowed to do this on a test basis. And they actually now have the University of Michigan have a policy because when the word got out, they were like, you know, we get a call, like, what are you guys doing? And you tell them, and then after a while, the word goes out. <laughs> so, um, but you always want to ask, because there might be something you can do. And that kind of tees into, is your institution willing to cost share? When we talk about cost sharing, there's actually cost sharing where your institution says, yes, we will support the study and put this amount of resources into the study. That's different than your chair of your department saying he's willing to share a coordinator. <laughs> So when you talk about cost share, there actually is an opportunity to cost share for agreements that you can, you know, your institution has their own policies and their own mechanisms to initiate cost share. But a lot of institutions are willing to do that. Um, again, when you're thinking about how to package proposals, what you can do for the budget, again, do you have startup costs at each site? For most of our sites, we have a flat rate um, startup costs. Some of my colleagues that work with different networks, they provide, like, for subject payments at this amount, and then they provide 5% effort for the PI. Some people do that. It gets really complicated, and then you have to sort out whether or not 
when is he the enrolling person, when is he the file waiter? So that gets a little messy. But so you guys want to kind of again think about how you're going to have to handle your startup costs. Again, we find set funds with coordinated really needs a milestone phase. Are all the um, all the same or differing um, dollars for patient reimbursements at sites? We do understand that people have different costs, but we um, also they have different F and A recoveries. But we leave it up to each institution to kind of work that out there. So that's why we have a flat rate. But again, when you start thinking about if you want to try to get with this institution and start working with different F and A rates, and it's a little challenging. And then when it comes to travel. If it's an easier thing to do, we actually keep the travel for our grants um, as part of the central award versus giving each site a travel budget. Because many times with travel budgets, there's flexibility. So if I'm at the University of Michigan and I send my collaborator at the University of really fun, <laughs> if I send him travel, they may allocate it for some other use instead of travel, and then my money's gone. So for travel, we keep our travel. So when we think about budgeting, some of the things we have here, again, it's um, good to you know, have conversations, but some of the common paradigms we find when we're talking to people about budgets is um, people won't participate if we, unless we call them a subcontract. Like, you know, this person, do you understand who this person is? He's very famous in this area. You can't, he's not a vendor. He is an investigator, collaborator. Sometimes that's challenging, but we'll just have a conversation about um, the, the circular and why we want to um, treat them as such. Um, we understand that our studies, our clinical trials, are scientific, that they aren't providing a service, and they are service units, and that they're not just enrolling sites, and that um, one of the comments that we had when we tried to work with perceptual payments is that, well, you know, this person's going to meetings, he's going to be participating in the paper, but again, it's that unique expertise that you need to sort out. Um, Another common paradigm that we went through is site enrollment is evenly distributed. We know that's not true. It's not true for any study. I mean, if you look across, there's always some imbalance in the numbers. Um, again, all persons that are listed must be included on the budget. If you are working with a collaborator, if he always includes his grad student and his you know, junior people, if your budget can't bear that, and they're not making a serious contribution, then that's the time that you, know, you have to have a conversation. It seems like you know that you know you can have a rational argument, but sometimes you see again these scientific snowballs where there's a lot of people that end up on you know on a grant proposal. And then another common paradigm is that F and A is fixed and final. Of course, my medical school would want me to tell you that, but there are opportunities for conversation. Um, and we know that there are with other groups. We know there's opportunities for conversation because a lot of our participants in the net. Um, have different rates that they've worked out with their institutions. So the most important thing I can tell you when you're working on a budget is to get input from people, ask coordinators that are doing work, ask other collaborators at other sites, ask people from your grants office. You might have a group that was, you know, a CTSA that helps with for subject payments or has fixed costs, you know, how much is a CT at your site. Um, that might be different again than a CT down at another site. And then here I just put some helpful resources. Um, the uniform guidance, I put a little um, caution mark there. The uniform guidance um, is the NIH, they're working on some a new policy about how funds can be spent. Um, all institutions are really following this. It's like a hot topic now because of how high will change funding. There's some, you know, amounts in there that capitate um, vendor agreements and things like that. So we're all watching that. So I put the link to the so at this time, I just like to open it up if anybody has any questions, because again, your proposals are all unique, and um, you have any different questions. Can, yeah. I make, can I just make a couple comments? And then we'll have to Very much. Questions. So one thing, probably the most common, as part of the show, the most common um, cost chair is salary cap. Does everybody know what the salary cap is? The NIH has a cap on salary. Many of the foundations have caps on salary. So if I hire my colleague, ask him to join my trial, and he's an expert endocrinologist at the University of Michigan, and he makes a half a million dollars a year, the salary cap is still 179.9. So when I 
put him on for 20%, he's got to put 20% effort in, but I'm only paying 20% on 179.9. Does that make sense to everyone? So there's this huge <laughs> gap. So if it makes sense to them, then <laughs> that's a whole other problem. <laughs> but you guys have to think about when you're grabbing someone who's a super expert, what the, what the budget implications are on that. Um, and also for those of you who I know we have some neurosurgeons and interventional radiologists and things, if you're over the salary cap, there's an implication that you've made a commitment for that amount of effort even though you won't be paid for that amount of effort. Does that make sense to everyone? The other thing I would encourage you to do is build in your salary increases. If any of you, I know there's some fellows here if you're at a fellow salary when you submit the grant, but you know you're going to be at an assistant professor salary in year one, build that in. Because otherwise, you're stuck with 20% of your salary from when you were a fellow, because that's what you entered. Does that make sense to folks, too? And a lot of people will build in 3% salary increase so that it's at least it's in there, the money comes to you. Would you agree, Val, with yes. those things? And, um, yeah, and that's why we share it for your now to read the award notice to see where the um, cap on salaries is. Some foundations will allow you to use actual salary. The NIH, again, has a cap that they call the executive level salary that you can pay up to. So again, you want to make sure that you read here to see what's allowable in the grant. And cost sharing, in your medical school, um, because so many people now have different or in different places, we'll share with you whether or not they consider that a true cost share or um, whether or not they have a, a cap for the offset. Another thing too, just to kind of build upon, is that when you're looking at salaries, um, if you're looking for a place and you're trying to get under a cap, what you don't want to do is look at the least expensive person's salary and you're going to use that salary. It would seem like it would make sense. Of course, you, the salary has to be reasonable. So you can't say that you're paying a data entry person $150,000 to do data entry, because that's not reasonable. But you probably don't want to look at the lowest um, coordinator salary on the ring, because if that person leaves, then you're trying to replace them with someone whose salary may be a little bit higher. So you really need to be careful about that. So you want to be fair and reasonable. Again, contact your institution, because they may have some guidelines on that, or you can kind of see, like, I can pull a report for people who are in a certain job class and kind of see where salaries are going. But you want to make sure it fits fair and reasonable. Um, for low-risk for low risk studies, um, have you seen this frequently done where, where you know, subjects or patients might actually be reimbursed directly for their participation? Um, and sort of what ranges? And is it per hour or per completed trial? Or? Absolutely. No, that's a great question. Um, and that's just respect for our research subjects. You know, and that's one of our costs that we would consider in the other costs. So in the patient care, the patient reimbursement. So especially when the gas was taking a spike, um, people were having challenges if they're coming in for exams because they're like, hey, this is $5 a gallon you know, and we're looking for to come in. So you should always think about compensating people for their time. So if you think about the cost of their time, if you think, wow, um, let's, you know, if I'm going to enroll a physician for a neurosurgeon, you know, like Karen pointed out, someone who makes a really a reasonable salary and you, know, you want to reimburse for their gas, you would suggest a payment and then your institution, your IRB, needs to approve any patient payments that you're making because they want to make sure that it's reasonable and you're compensating people at a fair rate. They want to make sure it doesn't seem so lucrative that no one can refuse. So they'll, um, they'll give you guidance on that. But you want to think about, and just think about, you would want to be reimbursed, you would want to reimburse people if you want to be reimbursed. So if you're going to spend four hours of your time when you're driving and you have to park, a lot of times people will validate parking. And that's an allowable cost for, for subjects. It's not an allowable cost for your lab meeting, but it definitely is an allowable cost for your subjects. So then again, you just want to figure out. So if you, again, the reasonable man's cost, and then your institution will tell you whether or not you're on the market. So a uh, two-part question. Um, um, relating to multi-site clinical trials. You mentioned at some point early in your talk, I don't think I, maybe I didn't understand this, but you said that the originating site is not allowed to budget for a per patient per visit, in, in a patient per patient per visit kind of a way, even if you're enrolling. Um, I, that, yes, 
Yeah, well, no, that, that is true. So most institutions won't allow you to reimburse yourself with the first subject payment. They want you to budget your time and effort. So you're allowed to budget it, but you're just not allowed to pay yourself again. It's kind of like double ticket. Uh, okay. So right. So if you're if you have a coordinator on your staff and you're covering your effort and your effort is covered, or you have somebody who's enrolling at your institution, their effort's covered. That's the way you want to reimburse your salary. You can't say, oh, I have a coordinator. Yeah, for such a payment as well. Okay. And um, if I have a subcontract, I guess with I don't know five institutions that are all recruiting at their sites, do I pay double f &A? So do I pay the f and at my institution and then I have to pay them the amount to cover their f and as well? So, you know, so many times you do, it depends on how you treat your payments. NIH will pay that kind of money? I mean, well, that seems like <laughs> an astonishing amount of So that gets back in, no, you're right. And so that gets back into your award list. So if the award notice, um, they say how do you need to structure your payments. That um, I will stroke that. There was a publicly available notice out there that they only can collect f and in a certain way. Um, for R25, for example, they say you can only take 8% of the dollars. So many times if there's restrictions on how f and is collected, then you have to um, consider that. So with the per subject payments for hybrid payments, we, look, we have consideration that institutions will have f &A. We give them, let's just say, to use a nice round number, we give them $1,000 and we say, it's up to you and your institution to discuss how they're going to take f and out of your payment. Some institutions, they got a waiver, some consider it at a lower rate. Well, we leave that up to you. Now, if I have a subcontract with you and we have to pay your f and it does. I have to pay f and on the first $25,000 it's sent to you. And then for your institution, if you're a collaborator, I have to cover your F&A to your institution. And that gets back into one of our original slides when you're looking at funding. When you're putting the budget together, is the facilities and administrative cost that are um, applied to other institutions, is that part of your direct cost? Or is it exempt from your direct cost? So yeah, that happens. Um, and I don't you know, think anybody in a spot. You're you know, looking at ways to um, kind of curtail that. And if things that relate to F&A, maybe in your funding announcement. That's why I put in there with different announcements, F&A's um, recovery may be different, and it may you know, have restrictions. And maybe just to put a little bit more granularity on that example, so say that Clinical Trial Network X is giving you $1,000, and your institution's F&A rate is 50%. So then your directs that you're taking out of that is 666, the number of fees. And the, uh, the FNA that you have to pay out of that thousand dollars is three thirty three. And if you work out something with your dean to say, well, you know, I think this is off-campus research, the rate that we would use is twenty five percent. Then I'm not going to do the math in my head because um, I only had that one number worked out. But then, then it gives you an incentive to work with your institution to say it has to be appropriately classified. You can't say, well, it's, you know, this is off-campus research. It's like you can't say, well, the emergency department's off-campus, but the rest of the hospitals on campus. So it, it, it raises interesting issues, but that's one way that ends up getting structured in those situations. Yeah, and just to kind of build upon that, for many of our clinical trials with the net, we had a waiver on f &A. So if we were um, providing you a per subject payment that $1,000 for trial X, the University of Michigan, I had a waiver, so we wouldn't take any money. So we would get money from another institution and just pass it right through, we didn't even touch it. Um, now you can ask for those waivers. Um, they're a little less common than you see. But we did, so many of our clinical trials, at least four, three, four of them I can think off the top of my head, we didn't assess f and at all on the money that we went to, that went to the sites. Now our institution, they said if you want to keep doing that, what you should do is just have the department you know, cover that. If you guys can afford, or you don't need f and to cover the lights, to cover administrative salaries, your department can pay that, and then you know you can just pay it back to the sites, and that gets really complicated. But yeah, that's, that does how it works. But again, a lot of people work with their institutions, and that's why I put in some of the common paradigms that FNA is fixed. But it's always worth starting a discussion. And knowing that the, the general goal of this course is for helping you develop your, your single center trials, one other thing that is a useful activity in this space, some of you have done, some of you I'm sure will do is be a site PI for a multi-center trial. 
in which case you're not the creator of this, but you're the recipient of this. And you have to look at that pile of $1,000 and say, how can I pay for a portion of a coordinator, or pay for a portion of an investigator effort? How can, can I make that, you know, do I have enough patients to, with this disease who I can feasibly enroll to make this a reasonable, um, and, and you know, what, you know, if, it's the pl if it's the place where the, um, the chair has free coordinators and hasn't yet moved to the sunny place west and south of here, then that may be simple. You can all get a lot of that to that. Although I would say that if you're bringing in money, they would probably want you to be paying into their pool um, somehow. So I, that's, I think that's, that's an important thing to think of when you're looking at these. Not only that someday you'll hopefully be creating them as PIs of multi-center trials with the help of people from, from networks who've done this before, but also critically evaluating them. And this goes not only for NIH-funded research, but also industry-funded research. Can the salary that, or can the reimbursement that's being provided allow you to feasibly carry out the research? So I think that's that's an important thing to consider. And it tees back into some of the things we talk about benchmarking with other institutions. In your institution, um, for example, you may have a bed charge, but you have a certain nursing costs. In other institutions, they may not have a certain type of bed charge for research, but their nurses may be union and you know, aren't allowed to do activities, so you have to have a coordinator or a special nurse come in, so it doesn't, so again, that's when you want to talk to other people, benchmark, um, like Will was saying, that you know, you may be doing some single site activities, but you know, your proposals that you're turning in now, you may look and you know, you want to collaborate with a hospital down the road, or you may um, take a position at, you know, again, University of Western Warm, you know, and but you want your um, colleague to still enroll subjects at your site, but you don't enroll subjects at your new site. So there's all kinds of things that can happen that you want to think about. Again, benchmarking is your friend when it comes to this, um, just to kind of understand when you're structuring for such a payment. And you know, everybody kind of gets up against that ceiling where you want the per subject payment to be reasonable, but again, you want to go through the algorithm of the intervention map out what all your costs are, get some reasonable amounts of supply that cost and make sure your patient, per patient payments are there. When we think about f &A recovery, when I do a budget, I consider it in a per subject payment at a certain amount. Um, and then, you know, because I know they're going to have something there. Um, for example, for average for f &A rates for our network for quite some time was about 50%. So we would consider that in there. An institution where had the ability to back it in for um, Work out an agreement, but again, that cost, you know, it wasn't like they were out, you know, you know, spending it on something differently. They may have, I remember someone passionately saying, You don't have a union, your nurses are unionized. So that person was able to work at a, the FA rate, negotiate the institution, and take those dollars and cover the salaries for unionized nurses. So it's, it, you know, it's again kind of working within the paradigm with that you can at least ask. Um, any other questions here or thoughts, additions? All right, great. Well, let me give uh, Valerie a round of applause.